The topic of this talk is don't limit yourself. So you know what to expect, don't limit yourself. But it's really the keynote of this book that we've been using this month, A New Design for Living by Ernest Holmes. And the first thing he invites us to do is to evaluate ourselves. Now, not from an ego mind point of view, but from the point of view is, are we really connecting with the awe and wonder around us that was created by God? Are we connecting with the realization that God created you and you and you and you and everyone as individual expressions of himself, himself, itself? That is awe and wonder. You are a very important individual expression of God. If we didn't have this energy that is filling this body, we wouldn't be here. There would be nothing. This energy field that permeates the whole universe is the life energy of this thing we call infinite intelligence. And we are nothing without it. Having been a chaplain for a number of years, I've been present when people make their transition when they die. And when the energy leaves, there's just a body with no life left in it. The energy is what's so important. And so when Ernest Holmes is saying, don't limit yourself, it's like, don't waste it. Don't waste this energy. It's very humbling to think about this. I sit at home in the lake and like to watch, look at the mountain and the flowers, and it's very humbling when I realize the mountain and I are one, the birds and I are one, that we have this inner connection. My brothers and sisters, all of us are one. It's very humbling to run in this crowd of people, very humbling. And so God created this order and this sense and this freedom to express it to the best of our ability. Now, who's going to want to sit on that and not do anything with it? Not anyone who has some intelligence or some connection with this piece of who we are. So our mind is in action. It's always in action, whether we're paying attention to it or not, whether being the guardian of it or not. But this creative energy that's already in us is waiting to be kick-started in various areas of our life. There's probably an area of your life where you've just been sitting on it, waiting for a better day or more money or a better relationship or a different job. Or There's part of our life that we're probably just sitting on. Yet the creative impulse of the universe is going, come on, you've got it in you already. All the infinite intelligence of the universe is at your disposal. Don't limit yourself. I always get impressed when I read anything by Dr. Holmes because he quotes a lot of people, which means these are people he studied. So I want to find out who are these people? Who did he study to create such a magnificent work as the science of mind? And in one of the, in this uh, book, A New Design for Living, he quotes a gentleman by the name of Henry Frederick Emil. I thought, never heard of that guy liked his quote, so I googled him. And luckily I found him. He just popped right up. And he was a moral philosopher in Geneva, Switzerland in the mid-1800s. Now that of itself is interesting, a philosopher in the middle of the 1800s that Ernest Holmes would quote. But when I read about him, it said that when he was a young child, his parents both died. Now that leaves you in pretty poor position when you're in the middle of the 1800s in Europe. But what he decided to do is travel all over Europe and meet with the most intelligent people of the time and become friends with them. It wasn't the aristocracy; It was the people who were considered the most intelligent at that time. And for over 30 years he did this and he wrote about it every day. And it wasn't until after he died that someone took all his papers and made a book and it's called The Journey in Time. And I went on Amazon, and I'll be darned, they had a copy, so I bought it. I can't wait to get it. I'm so excited to learn about the intelligence of the mid-1800s. Because this guy, there's something about his quote that just spoke to me, so I'll read it. He floats with the current who does not guide himself according to higher principles, who has no ideals, no convictions, such a man is a mere article of furniture. 
a thing moved instead of living and moving and being. An echo, not a voice. A man who has no inner life is a slave of his surroundings. As the barometer is the obedient servant of the air at rest, the weathercock, the humble servant of the air in motion. Now that's a big quote, so I want to piece it out a little bit so you get, it's just spoke to me so much. The person who isn't guided by higher principles or convictions. Now in Science of Mind, we talk about principles as being law. In this case, he's talking about principles that are standards of good behavior. And convictions means strong beliefs or values. So the person who isn't guided by higher principles or convictions floats with the current. And you know what that means, living near the Sacramento River. You're just floating. You're not in control at all. The person who isn't guided by higher principles or convictions is a mere article of furniture, a thing moved instead of being moved. <laughs> A thing moved instead of a living, moving being. Sorry about that. You get the picture. You know that couch in your living room that hasn't moved for 20 years? Can you relate to that? A person who isn't guided by higher principles or convictions is an echo, not a voice. That really bothered me. It was almost like an insult. Would you agree, choir? <laughs> you're not an echo, you're a voice. A person who has no inner life is a slave of their surroundings. It's kind of like in our time that, you say, well, just retire and take it easy. And I know a number of people who have retired and they're taking it so easy, they're like furniture and being, you know, moved by their surroundings. That's not what we teach here, if, if you haven't known that yet. A person who has no inner life is an obedient servant to what's around him, who's around him, and other people who are doing things. Then he uses two examples, and one is a barometer. Now, you might have one in your house. They're those things that sit on the wall, and they, they just never do anything. They just sit there. But they're, they're reacting to the pressure of the air, the air pressure. And how boring is that? But Paul looks at it every day. The barometer moved. It did? Oh, my gosh. The barometer moved. OK. <laughs> Where did it go? It just moved this tiny little bit. And then he talks about the weathercock, which is a weather vane that only moves when the wind blows it. So you get that analogy. So let's go back over this because it's, it's so good. He floats with a current who does not guide himself according to higher principles, who has no ideal, no convictions. Such a man is a mere article of furniture, a thing moved instead of a living and moving being, an echo, not a voice. The man who has no inner life is the slave of his surroundings, as the barometer is obedient to the air at rest, the weathercock, the humble servant of the air in motion. I hope when I get this book, Luke said, tell me what it says. So that'll be a subject of a talk someday. So when I say Henry Frank or Frederick Eimel, you'll go, oh yeah, I remember that guy. So we are the result of the infinite intelligence of God acting on purpose. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a fluke that you're here. It wasn't a mistake that you're here. Our mind is part of that mind that created the universe. How great is that? And so our movement, our evolution is part of our nature. So if you're feeling stuck, go to a practitioner, come and see a minister because we can help you find that place that the creative nature of spirit is pushing, pushing. And you don't want the two by four. You want to be just gently guided into a new experience of creativity. Dr. Raymond Charles Barker was one of Ernest Holmes' most favorite, famous uh, ministerial students. And he said the creative part of our nature is the intelligence factor. That's because it's been established that our thought is really a thing. It's an energy that goes before us, acts as a magnet to bring to us our consistent thoughts, our beliefs. And so Barker calls worry unintelligent. It's an unintelligent factor. And that's Barker. He's always in your face. He's just very clear. Worry is unintelligent. You were not made to be unintelligent. You were not created to be unintelligent. And so whenever negative thoughts appear, 
It's a warning sign. If we hang on to them, it's a warning sign. Now, our Mr. Karaoke, Dave Encore, you remember Dave used to sing karaoke here, and you probably remember a poster on the bulletin board. He was going to uh, move to Costa Rica and selling his equipment. His equipment didn't sell, but he was still moving to Costa Rica. Well, he came in the other day because he wanted to just get square in his mind what happened to him because it was a life-changing experience. He got in his car with his dog and all of his belongings, and he's headed to Costa Rica, and everyone said, Me Mexico is a very, very dangerous place. Very dangerous. Be very, very careful. You're on your own driving in Mexico. It's very, very dangerous. So he was really worried when he crossed into Mexico. In fact, um, I enjoyed watching a, a video because he had a video camera on his little visor there to be sure that he recorded everything that was going to happen because it was so dangerous. <laughs> and what he found was people were fun. They were loving. They were helpful. He didn't have any problems. And, and the highlight of the video I was watching on Facebook is he's going, coming through a tunnel at Mazatlan, and there's a donkey walking in the middle of the tunnel. And it's donkey and tunnel. He's yelling, donkey and tunnel. And that was the excitement of Mexico. <laughs> but when he crossed the border into Nicaragua, he got robbed. Inst almost instantly. He is so paranoid of Mexico, and it went beautifully. But the emotion of being constantly worried of, I'm going to get robbed, I'm going to get, I'm going to, and then cross the border, he lets down his energy, and boy, whoosh, here come the robbers. And it scared the heck out of him. It scared him so badly that he was done with his trip. Now, what was he going to do? Well, since all the fear was gone, because he had nothing left except him and his dog and his car, he met wonderful people who helped him sell his car, who helped him find a way to get, because everything was gone, get enough money to um, get a plane ticket home for him and his dog. And they flew home, and he's so glad He's so, so grateful, because it was the most terrifying experience of his life. But when he came back, he realized that the girlfriend he had was really his soulmate. And so a lot of good things are happening out of this. And so we had a lot of laughs about this pent-up fear. Pent-up fear. If you ever have that, my gosh, please come and see a practitioner. Help somebody dissipate that before something very unpleasant or life-changing happens. So we could talk about it and find divine right, divine right action in, ha in that experience. And I could hear it coming when he was telling me. I was like, oh, boy. So <laughs> anyway, don't need to go that far. Don't need to hold those thoughts too long. But right now, he's back, and it's springtime, and we're planting flowers. And there are so many beautiful flowers. But it's a time for planting flowers, not weeds. Anybody plant weeds? Anybody? <laughs> It's a time to plant flowers. And why do we do that? We do it because they're beautiful. They're exquisite. The colors are just radiating. You know, it's the, a paintbrush of God. I, I look at some of these flowers, and they're so symmetrical, and they're so vivid with color. And you know, it's the hand. We could not create a flower like that. It's the hand of God that did that, the one that created you to be a flower in your own life. Now, if we plant the flowers and then we ignore them, some weed seeds are going to blow in, and we have to keep pulling them out and weeding them out in order to keep that beautiful garden. So take your life as a metaphor for that garden, or a garden as a metaphor for your life. How many weeds are growing? Any weeds? Anything you'd like to yank out and throw away? Send it to the dump? Might be a few. But if you're planting flowers in your life, you're going to do it consciously. But it's the people that don't do it consciously that get potluck. A bunch of weeds, a bunch of wildflowers, and a bunch of work. So garden without weeds. Weed your garden frequently. And some of these weeds are really mental ruts that we found ourselves in. You know, these ruts, I remember back in my logging days, I wasn't logging, but I was working with all the loggers, and you go down these forest service roads, and they're all dirt, and they have these big ruts in them, and you think you're going to bottom out at times. And these ruts are there because everybody did the same thing the same way every day. 
And we get our life like that in some areas. We get these ruts and they're real comfortable because it's going to take some effort to drive outside the ruts and carve a new road in our consciousness. And so what mental ruts might you have going on in your life? Something that's so comfortable but is not creative, it's just comfortable and you sit on it. It's not what we're meant to do. A mental rut might be, well, it's a depressed economy. Well, it's a depressed housing market. Well, it's a depressed job market. And after a while, we find ourselves depressed and we're shocked. <laughs> I mean, really, that's what happens. We listen too much to the news, and we are shocked that it makes us depressed. So Ernest Holmes and Raymond Charles Barker are saying, wait a minute, you're made of God stuff. You're made of the stardust. You're made of the universe. You're not meant to get yourself in that kind of mental rut. So I invite you to think about where you're doing that. Now, Raymond Charles Barker is, I love his book, The Power of Decision. If you've ever read it, you know how powerful it is. He's, he's in your face on every page. And so what I uh, did today is I, I took some of his quotes, and I'm calling them Science of Mind Fortune Cookies. And I've got them in the back, so come and see me. You can pick a fortune cookie, which is a, a Barkerism. And uh, I invite you to say this with me. I am an open channel for bigger ideas. I am, open channel for bigger ideas. I am the means by which heaven is revealed on earth. The mind of God is a well that never runs dry. Doesn't that feel good? Versus that other rut that's kind of hanging on there? Yes, we need bigger, better ideas in this world, and you can do them for yourself and others in your life. These are ideas free of any negativity, and you know, it's, it's an idea like if you're stuck in the past, what telephone did you have about 20 years ago? I had one of those bag phones that took up half your front seat in the big bag and you plug it in the cigarette lighter. And how telephones have moved beyond that. I, I'm just in awe. And yet I haven't moved much farther beyond that because I have a cell phone and it's been dead for two weeks. Every time I open it, I go, yeah, it's, it's still dead. <laughs> <laughs> but also think about your communication skills. And I'm talking to myself at this point. Uh, I've never texted. Now, a lot of us elders haven't texted, but our grandchildren have. If you want to stay up with your grandchildren and keep in communica communication, it's going to take learning these tools because in another 10 years, who knows where it's going to be? You know, uh, National Geographic had a picture of a newborn baby on the cover not long ago, and it said this baby's going to live to be 120 years old. What's communication going to be like then? I mean, it's just mind-blowing, mind-blowing. So I encourage you, keep your creative nature flowing. Keep, keep yourself on that growing edge, and I'm, gonna, I'm really going to work on that. You know, occasionally I mention grandson Nick up in Alaska, and his stepmom's not too happy with this teenager doing stuff that she never thought teenagers would do, but she only raised daughters, and now Nick. And so it's like... I don't know, how did this happen? So on his Facebook page, I go on every once in a while and send him a little note. To, I never hear back from him, you know, it's grandma's note. But, but I send him notes and I keep thinking, maybe I'll just say the right thing and he'll get it. Well, I love books. I always sent my brother books and for years my brother would say thank you and then finally he said, you know, I've never read any of those books. <laughs> I said, it just made me feel good, just know that. So here's a book I'm going to send Nick. It's called, Don't Worry, It Gets Worse. <laughs> a 20-somethings, mostly failed attempts at adulthood. <laughs> Nick, listen to this. Before you're 20, I mean, I'm just like, oh, well, please. Well, she has some good ideas in there because she's gone through everything. And the book is to say, you know, I've been through this and I've been through that, and believe me, it's not worth going there. For instance, she says, um, she was broke, really broke at one time, and she says, an option to save money is to move in with your parents, which is very smart, if you can tolerate their endless discussion about what Twitter is all about. <laughs> you can be in an apartment 
And if you're in an apartment, you don't have to pay your electric bill for four months. But, but then you get this notice, and it says they're going to turn your electricity off. Then you have to call them, and you're online for over two hours, listening to some voice tell you how you can save your energy. It's not worth it. Avoid going to the laundromat. That'll save money. But then eventually your towels smell like mold, and you have to buy new ones. And just stop drinking expensive coffee. Just use good old-fashioned fear of the unknown to keep you awake at night. <laughs> you know, becoming an adult is an overwhelming experience for a teenager. There's a lot expected of them and a lot of roads that we, we haven't shared with them how to be. So maybe he'll, maybe he'll give this to a friend and his friend will share this. You won't believe what your grandma's book said. Who knows, something like that. But you are pure intelligence, always acting intelligently. And you know that to be true. And when we slip up, and we do, we've got the whole universe of creativity behind us to find a new way. So the power of decision has a lot of those answers of the kickstart in your life for creativity. And here's what Dr. Barker says. Each one of us is a vital component of the universe. Intelligence created each one of us to be alive in these times, in these times, because we are equipped to deal with these times. That's got to give some comfort. We are the result of our past decisions, and we will become the result of our present decisions. So decide on the side of greatness. Let's do a treatment about that. So join with me. There is only one, one power, one presence, and I and you are part of it. This infinite power, this infinite universe that create, contains within it the creative nature of spirit. An infinite potential for creating a life we love. A life where we are free to give and free to receive a life of abundance, abundance of friends, abundance in all areas. It is ours by divine right. I accept this for everyone here this morning. I accept that we truly know, we truly connect with how valuable we are. Each one of us, a valuable creation of the one. As I ponder that, I feel empowered. I feel empowered to look at those mental ruts and to say, eh, time to climb out. I feel empowered to let go of worry as unintelligence. I let go of it. I replace it with the knowledge and the wisdom of an all-loving and all-powerful God. We are light, beauty, joy, happiness. It is our nature. It's who we're meant to be at every moment of every day. And as we practice, we get better and better and better. So I am grateful for this teaching, grateful for the opportunity to share the truth of what I find in Dr. Holmes and all the fabulous texts he wrote and read. We are on a journey, an adventure of wonder and awe. And that is the story of our lives. Thank you, Spirit. It is so now. And so it is. Thank you. Before the ushers prepare for the offering, I realized that I didn't ask if we had any newcomers here for the first time today. Is there anyone here for the first time this morning? Over here? Uh, we have a newcomer packet. If you'll keep your hands up for just a bit, the ushers will give you a packet has information on our center. Welcome. And as the basket goes by you, please feel free to bless it, but don't put anything in it. Um, raise your hand again, if you would. Oh, and up here, too. Um, just know that you are very welcome to our center, and you are our guest today. So, and then there's one up here as well. Um, great, thank you. Now, the ushers are going to be preparing for our offering. 
And this is the time when we consciously reflect on all of our blessings and gifts, recognizing all that we have received as well as the gift of giving. And so I invite you as we begin this offering to consider all that you are gifted with. Our choir is going to sing a beautiful song. And um, the usher.